Hello everyone, once again it is a pleasure to welcome you all to MSP lecture series on interpretive spectroscopy. In my previous lectures I started discussing about NMR spectra of uh, various phosphorus containing compounds and also how to analyze if you get more than one product in a reaction. For example, if you get cis and I, trans isomers or if you get some other isomers, we should be able to elucidate and understand the structures of those molecules by simply applying phosphorus NMR spectroscopy. So, let us continue from where I had stopped. Let me take another interesting reaction here. This reaction you can see I have used two entities. One is cyclopentadienyl bis triphenyl phosphine chlororuthenium 2 plus that is reacted with bis diphenyl phosphenoamine ligand. So, that means in this reaction, although we know that when we are mixing in a known stoichiometry, we are supposed to get one product, but on the other hand, due to some reactivity difference that we gauge and that is what happens later, we end up getting more than one product. So, that means we may get a mixture of products as well. In that case, if we analyze by looking into the 1 p NMR spectrum of that reaction mixture that can tell you a lot more details and also that can also guide you how to plan our reaction by altering reaction conditions. For example, in this one as I said, this ruthenium 2 compound was treated with this bisphosphine. In the the above reaction I have shown here, we are getting three products 4, 5 and 6 in a different stoichiometries. Although the reaction is carried out in 1 is to 1 ratio, the expected product is 4. But how other two compounds are formed and how did we got this information? That one can see by simply looking into the 31 p NMR spectrum of the reaction mixture here. Several chemical shifts are there. But if you recall the first compound 4 where 2 triphenyl phosphines are replaced by bisphosphine. So, here both the phosphorus environments are identical as a result one can expect a single resonance here. So that means this is assigned to the product 4. Now, let us look into other products. Let us go back to the reaction. In this product 6, one triphenyl phosphine is there and one bisphosphine is there. Bisphosphine chemical environments are identical and we have PPH3. So, by simple thumb rule by looking into 2Ni plus 1 rule, we can anticipate a triplet for triphenyl phosphine and a doublet for bisphosphine because bisphosphine will be coupled with both of them together coupled with the triphenyl phosphine whereas triphenyl phosphine will be coupling with the two equivalent phosphorus centers from bisphosphine. So, we expect a triplet and a doublet for 6. So, you can see here a doublet is there and a triplet is there. This is for triphenyl phosphine and this is for chelated 2 phosphorus moieties of bis diphenyl phosphine amine. So, then we have left with 1 here, 1 here, 1 here for product 5. So, what is that product 5? So, product 5 if you see we have one dangling phosphine is there acting as a monodentate ligand. So, this is different and this is different and these two are identical. So, that means we are anticipating three signals and here this phosphine is farther away from this phosphine as a result this can just couple with coordinated phosphorus to show a doublet. But on the other hand the chelated phosphines also can couple with uh, coordinated phosphorus from the monodentate ligand to show a doublet, whereas this one would show a triplet with this one and a triplet is further split into doublets from this one. That means, we are seeing a, a multiplet for mono coordinated phosphorus and a doublet for bis coordinated or chelate compound and then again doublet for this one. So, let us see whether we have those things here. Yes, we have a doublet and we have a doublet with very small coupling constant value 
and also we have a multiplet here it is a triplet of doublets so we are seeing that one so that means this is giving some idea that three compounds are formed but again looking into the integration we can gauge how much quantity of each one is formed in what ratio and then looking into other two compounds where ionic products are there yes that means probably instead of using let us say I have used dichloromethane here instead of using dichloromethane if I use a polar solvent probably the formation of four can be diminished and formation of these two compounds can be enhanced yields on the other hand again by taking two stoichiometry two equivalents of bisdiphenylphenophosphine probably I can enhance the possibility of formation of five even more so this vital information comes for using those information so this reaction was carried out and this pure compound was obtained carrying out at low temperature and then by using two equivalents of uh, bisphosphine in polar solvent resulted in this compound and then using a polar solvent but one equivalent of bisdiphenyl phosphine used uh, resulted in this compound of course when once after making this compound if you bubble CO here this can form a carbonyl compound so this all vital information comes very nicely by analyzing the 31 pnmr spectrum of the mixture of uh, this reaction product that means it is not just to analyze and understand what kind of compounds formed it can certainly help us in altering our reaction conditions so that we can refine our methodology and later all these compounds were prepared in pure form and analyzed you can see here so these compounds are formed and then this compound was again prepared in a separate reaction by getting the information from the reaction mixture and then this was obtained in pure form and now let us look into few more examples here I have given three examples here one is a bisphosphine with both the phosphorus oxidized by selenium that is bis selenide derivative here and then I have here analogous to Vasca's compound both cis and trans chlorocarbonyl bisdiphenyl phosphine bis triphenyl phosphine rhodium and also the its uh, cis analog and they they differ significantly in their 31 pnmr spectra first let us look into bisphosphine here of course when we look into bisphosphine with uh, both the phosphorus oxidized by selenium here 31 pnmr spectrum would show a singlet and then it is coupled to selenium 77 selenium and that shows satellites here separation is called phosphorus selenium coupling constant so these are called satellite peaks and then if you look into selenium NMR again both the selenium centers are chemically and magnetically equivalent as a result they are equally coupled to phosphorus and we will see just a doublet and then this whatever the separation is there here in case of selenium NMR should be same as what we obtained in case of 31 pnmr that means coupling constants remain same no matter which nuclei you are using now let us look into trans compound here in case of trans compound you can see both the phosphors are identical by performing a C2 axis of rotation passing through C1 and Cl as a result you can see only one type of phosphorus and when you look into 31 pnmr they are simply coupled to rhodium to give a, a doublet here something like the very simple doublet is here and then this separation is called 1j rhp but when you look into this one here one triphenyl phosphino moiety here it is triphenyl phosphine one triphenyl phosphine is trans to co whereas the other one is cis to co so we cannot have c2 axis of rotation as a result two phosphorus atoms are chemically equivalent but they are both chemical and magnetically non-equivalent as a result it resembles am x spin system so pa is coupled with rhodium and then coupled with uh, phosphorus it shows a doublet of doublet in the same way pb is also coupled first with rhodium and each line is further coupled with phosphorus so first this is rhodium coupling and then this is phosphorus coupling whether you consider pa delta of pa or delta of pb they are very similar but slight marginal difference is there in chemical shifts and coupling constants so this is rhodium phosphorus coupling and then here it is 2j pp coupling so this is how we can distinguish 
cis and trans isomers in case if they are obtained in a reaction. Let us look into two more examples here. And we have here, we have a mixed ligand complex, platinum 0, a tetrahedral complex, where we have two trimethylphosphine and two diphenylphosphine. So that means platinum is in plus 2 state here. Two trimethylphosphines are neutral ligands, and here we have two diphenylphosphines. Uh, phosphides are there, they are anionic, so platinum is in plus 2 state, and it is a 16 electron complex. So now if you look into phosphorus NMR spectrum, we can anticipate two types of signals. So these two are identical, they are coupled with these two to give a triplet. These two will couple with equally to this one to give a triplet. And then these two will couple with this one to give a triplet. So what we should get is a triplet, something like this. And then platinum coupling would come. So basically platinum coupling would come with platinum satellites because of uh, 195 platinum is about 34 percent NMR active I equals half. So as a result, this is for 196 platinum, which is I equals 0. So then what we get is this is split into a doublet here, something like this, and then something like this. So if you look into the spectrum, it should look like This distance is called 1J PT P coupling. This is similar for both of them. This is similar for both of them. Whether we consider a signal for trimethylphosphine or we look into that one, they will be identical, but they will be having different chemical shifts. Here, this one is for 196 platinum. And then if you look into the integration, this would account for 66 percent, and then this would be 17 percent and then this is 17 percent. So this is how we can analyze uh, the spectrum and you can ignore this spectrum here. You can ignore this one and of course uh, you can also look into 1HNMR spectrum here because trimethyl group is there and this trimethyl group what happens? This is of course here you can see both are identical both the trimethyl phosphine groups and CH3 first it will be coupled with phosphorus to give a doublet and then each doublet something will be there, rhodium to hydrogen coupling, and then we will see a hydrogen to platinum coupling will be there, something like this again. So this is how the 1HNMR would look like. And most of the time, by default, when we are looking into phosphorus NMR, what we get is proton decoupled one. And of course, if we are interested in looking into phosphorus hydrogen coupling, then we can go for coupled one. In that case, it should be represented something like this. The moment we write in flower bracket next to phosphorus 31P, it indicates that 1H is decoupled and that means interaction of hydrogen protons in the magnetic field when we are measuring phosphorus NMR is nullified. So now I have another interesting compound here. In this one, it is a dimetallic compound here and two platinum atoms are there. At terminally, they are held by two trimethylphosphine each and the middle we have diphenylphosphide uh, ligand is there. So both the platinum if it is symmetric it will be 1, 1 or it can be one side it is platinum 0 and one side it can be platinum 2 also. So now we can look into the spectrum of this one here, how it looks like. Let me write the structure again here. This is about 195 platinum NMR. First we can look into 195 platinum NMR. This is the structure. So now, if you see, uh, these platinums are both chemically and magnetically equivalent. Both the platinums are coupled on either side by two different type of phosphorus units. So here, let us say first this is coupled with two phosphorus units and if you just look into 2Ni plus 1, it should be a triplet and then this separation or this separation would be 1J, PT, P, I should say PPH2. And now each of these signal will be further split by two end trimethylphosphine. So this will be coupled with first these two and then these two. So this separation is 1J 
pt p m e 3 so it, it shows a triplet of triplet and if you look into the spectrum it should look like 1 is to 2 is to 1 something like this so this is how that 195 platinum nmr looks like but on the other hand when we look into phosphorus nmr phosphorus nmr if you look into it these two are identical and they are equally coupled to 4 trimethyl phosphine as a result what would happen delta p p h 2 let me write here it will show first a quintet so it, it should show a quintet and then each quintet is further split into a doublet in the form of a satellite. So, as a result, what would happen is we get something like this. So, something like this. Again, this is for 66 percent and then this is 17 percent and this is 17 percent and then distance from the middle one to mid one or first one to first one, this is called 1 j p t p coupling and this spacing is called p p coupling, p p coupling. This is how you can write it, but on the other hand, this would look give a this one, these two are identical with this one, when they are coupled with this one, we get simply a triplet, sim triplet and then this triplet is split into another doublet because of platinum coupling. So, this would be something like this, something like this. Again here, this is your 1 j p t p coupling. So, this is how the spectrum can be analyzed. So, now let us look into other applications. We have several applications, are there one very important application I am going to show you, especially those who are working with nanomaterials and working with carbon compounds such as fullerenes, graphenes, graphene oxides and other things, very, very important one. Measuring epoxide content of carbon nanomaterials. The presence of epoxide on nanomaterials such as carbon nanotubes and fullerenes can be readily monitored by reacting these nanomaterials with triphenylphosphine. How it helps in understanding the presence of epoxide? So, this method involves the catalytic reaction of methyl trioxorhenium. So, an epoxide reacts with methyl trioxorhenium to form a five membered ring, and in the presence of triphenylphosphine, the catalyst is regenerated, forming an alkene, and then formation of triphenylphosphine oxide. So, when we add triphenylphosphine along with methyl trioxyrehenium to nanomaterial containing epoxide, oxygen is abstracted by triphenylphosphine to form triphenylphosphine oxide by simply taking the known quantity of triphenylphosphine and by monitoring the 31 p nmr spectra at regular intervals, we can quantify the amount of epoxide present by looking into the amount of triphenylphosphine is converted into triphenylphosphine oxide and how much is left at the end of the reaction. So, this is the reaction. For example, we have an epoxide is here and epoxide when it is treated with methyl trioxorhenium, it forms a cyclic system like this and when this cyclic system is treated with triphenylphosphine, it abstract oxygen from this oxocyclic system to form triphenylphosphine oxide and regenerating uh, methyl trioxorhenium through the formation of this olefin. So, now exactly this is what happens. So, for example, we have on graphene, we have epoxides are there, you just treat with this one. And then as I said here, triphenylphosphine abstract and uh, this one is regenerated and then by simply looking into the reaction mixture NMR, we can conclude that yes, since the amount of PPH3 used in the reaction is known the relative amounts of triphenylphosphine and triphenylphosphine oxide can be determined simply by looking into the integration of 31p signals in the spectrum and that in turn gives the amount of epoxide 
present on the nanotubes. So this is very, very important, very simple reaction. One can analyze and also one can also get rid of all these epoxides if they are not readed. So you can see here. 31p spectra before and after the reaction. Before the reaction, the full quantity is there. And now after the reaction, what happens? Partially PPH3 is converted into triphenylphosphine oxide, depending upon how many epoxide groups were present on nanomaterial. So then if you just look into the integration, now only 0.4 percent is left. Let us say if we have used two equivalents, 1.6 is converted into triphenylphosphine oxide, and now only 0.4 percent is left in the solution. So that gives how much is there in it. This is a very, very important uh, method one can use effectively for determining epoxides present. So let me stop here and continue with more interesting uh, examples in my next lecture. Until then, have an excellent time reading spectroscopy. Thank you.